the death of Superman lives, what happened? You're going to find out. Kevin Smith's going to help tell it. I got involved. That's what happened. And then it died. It was truly the death of Superman. I'm Dave Baker, and I'm here with John and Holly, the creators of Death of Superman Lives, What Happened. Uh, I, <laughs> I was lucky enough to see the movie last week when you guys screened it, and I thought that I, well, I am a huge Superman fan, and previous to your guys' movie, I thought that I knew everything about this movie. I was like, I've read the Kevin Smith draft. So wrong. Uh, could you talk to me about how crazy this movie is? Yeah. Leading off with like uh, Kevin Smith said the same exact thing. I mean, he was like, you know what? I have only seen and been a, a experience being part of it, this small part of it, and to see the film and to see where everything else went after he stopped being a part of it, and how that transformation, how bringing in Tim Burton and Nicolas Cage and all the concept art that was based on strongly off of just his original drafts because they didn't have drafts for the artists to look at. Just to see all that process and where they were going to take it, it, it really is like something that even I didn't know about when I endeavored the the document in the first place like to make it it was like I knew there was amazing concept art I knew that there had to be more than what is online so that was part of the interest for me that over the years you know seeing the concept art seeing Kevin Smith tell his story seeing Superman Returns and not not hitting it the way I wanted to hit it so it made me more interested in like oh there's a movie that has that science fiction heavy metal take it's a different version of Superman it has Brainiac it would have had Tim Burton's flavor on it Nicolas Cage is an inspired choice as an actor to play Superman I like movies that are different than the comic books that's my personal thing I I don't need someone to adapt a comic book and when they do and if they do and they do an exact version I'm gonna say do it like Zack Snyder did Watchmen I think that is, a, to me at least, a almost perfect adaptation. Even though Alan Moore took his name off, but he takes his name off of everything now. That's like almost word for word, shot for shot from Dave Gibbons, you know, comic book panels. Compositionally, a truly accurate thing, except for the squid at the end. A few liberties that are taken here and there. But even then, you have people who hate it. So you can never satisfy, hey, look, you can never satisfy comic book nerds because, yeah. hey, we're either going to love it or hate it. We're going to fight about it. We're going to talk about it. But for myself, like that to me, at least I love Watchmen. It's one of my favorite graphic novels ever written. That's a true adaptation, at least as far what, as what you can do without making a 12 hour miniseries. Yeah. That's all I'm saying about that. You can't go to the island with the artists. You can't <laughs> you can't explore the pyramid scheme. And that's why Sandman should be a series and not a movie. Well, you know, I won't say that, Holly, because I trust Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Neil Gaiman is writing the screenplay. I have my own opinion. I know, but that's why we will argue about it. I think, I think personally, the Sandman movie is going to be incredible. So I'm looking forward to it. Sure, it could be a TV series, but I'd like to see it cinematically. And that, that ability to take something to the cinema is what differentiates. Even though we're in the age of television now and the regeneration, the golden age of television, I think movies are able to take it to that next level. And I think the cinematic version of Sandman will be a little bit visually more explosive than what they would be able to pull off on a TV budget. So, anyway, sorry, we 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 tangented this week on tangent. Um, Superman. So that's what really interests me was like, can we get to see and get to explore what could have been and what is under the surface of what's been shown to the public? And we only had about five percent, literally, of what you have seen or known about. Uh, well, the weirdest part. Uh you know what? One really weird part was something that didn't make it into the movie, which was some of the casting options that they had for uh, all of the characters before Tim Burton was even brought on. Um, uh, like Matthew McConaughey for Superman. I mean, Nicolas Cage was still the main choice, but like Skeet Ulrich, remember the 90s? Um, so that was one. He was on a list. Uh, yeah. It was, it, it, I mean, the list was kind of, it was so, so quintessentially 90s. Like, we'll, we'll post those at some point. But um, the, the other one was like a mind blower was uh, Howard Stern as Brainiac. He was at the top of the list for Brainiac. Um, private, parts. Private, parts. private parts, exactly. It was a real you know, hot number at the time. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was kind of shocking. But I think ultimately, like, looking at the concept art and seeing the, the artwork for Lexiac uh, slash Luthiac was, was like, and imagining Christopher Walken and Kevin Spacey doing that. Yeah. Like, oh my god. I'm going to kill Superman. No, you're not. I'm going to kill him. It's like to me like it doesn't even matter what any uh, anything else in the movie if we could have just seen Kevin Spacey and Christopher Walken on a spider <laughs> body in the, the skull ship that would have just made everyone's uh, dreams and nightmares at the same time. It would have been like this is fantastic and incredible and strange and 
That's that's what you get when you get like the. That's what you get. That's what you get when you get Tim Burton, you know, and and Nicolas Cage and something. You get a lot of creativity. You you get them pushing the boundaries of what would be even ex accepted in a comic book film, let alone just a fantastical film. It would have been a cosmic fairy tale. I think it would have been a lot of fun. Uh, the thing that's so crazy about the fact that you guys had so much access, like you had Tim Burton, you had you, how did you get all the artwork? Mm. Took a long time. The access took a lot of time. So that's, you know, when it did the Kickstarter, it took like literally about a year just to even start to get some of the artists, some of the concept artists. We like, even before we got the money for the Kickstarter, we were starting to, we met uh, Kerry Gamble at, uh, at Monster Palooza and did an interview. He was our very first yeah. interview. He was our very first interview, but yeah. In his hotel room. It was very piecemeal at first. Yeah. You know, we, we didn't expect to see Kerry Gamble. We didn't expect to see Pete Von Shelley, who's yeah. one of the monster artists. Uh, but, but we interviewed those guys first. Um, and they were cool, you know, they were, they, they, I, you know, many of the artists were kind of reticent at first because they didn't want to be interviewed unless we talked to Tim Burton. So once we did talk to Tim Burton, then the floodgates sort of opened for us. But this, that concept art that you see in the movie is all from Tim directly because he, his executive producer, Derek Fry, who has been absolutely instrumental in the making of this film, um, he gave us access to the costume test footage that Which Nicholas, like the it's, it is the Holy Grail footage. Yeah, um, but he also gave us access to that, that studio, and, and we were there for two days shooting artwork. And what you see in the film, it's a lot, but there's so much more than, than even that. We couldn't, even, we couldn't fit all of the artwork into the film. Like It's like not worth cram-festing it, but it was like, you know, there's other elements of stuff that we just had to cut out, but it's like, that's the that was a truly unique experience of like, finally getting to talk to Tim Burton. It all happened because of someone out there, like someone who knew about the Kickstarter, who wanted to find out about Superman Lives. They happened to be working in Canada on Almost Human, right next to where Big Eyes was being made. So they were like, look, I don't want to get fired, but I'm going to give you the production manager's email and number. You can call them because they're shooting Big Eyes. And I wrote them a really nice four paragraph email. I left a really nice message. Didn't hear anything for like a month. I was like, all right, that's, a, that's not going anywhere. Then I get then I get uh, an email from uh, Derek Fry, and it had gotten passed along. They were like, you want me to handle this? You know, because obviously Tim Burton gets tons of emails and requests all the time. So people have to go down the, and up in the chain of command. And he said, look, I'll talk to the guy. He's not sure if he wants to be involved. How long can you wait? I said, I could wait forever. So cut to six months later. He said, call back in six months. We'll figure it out. Six months pass. All right, look. In five months, Tim might have a window between this movie and this Monday m movie. He wants to meet you. Can you just come out to London and then we'll decide from there? So, you know, I couldn't announce anything while I'm like doing this. You know, I couldn't say on any social media, like totally locked down Tim Burton. <laughs> toots. Yeah, yeah, we toots. toots. I would say that actually the three things that were really the, the, the way we got this made was tenacity, luck, and personality. Because people who talked to John were very set at ease instantly just on meeting him, you know? So, um, and that meant across the board. Um, so it was very, once we had the access, all the pieces started, started to fall together. And once people knew the direction we were taking with it, they felt a lot more trusting. Right. We weren't making a comedy piece. I'm known for doing comedy shows and stuff, so I, I, I wonder if they thought I was going to like space ghost the whole thing or whatever. Yeah, but like, like have people like lasers coming out of their eyes while they're talking or what? You know, who knows what they thought? But I was actually coming at it from a real earnest kind of super comic book nerd fan, and as also just somebody who's been in the business who wanted to explore the unmaking of a film. And this this really felt like something personal to me. So it's something that interested me on so many different levels. Uh, that I wanted to, you know, try it, and then as we were making it, it became something more fantastical and something I couldn't wait to share with everyone. So being here at Comic Con is really the payoff. It's like we launched, everyone got their, everyone from Kickstarter and Fanback got their digital download. We've been selling all of the digital downloads on on our our site www.tdoslwh.com. Uh, where you can get all the stuff. And then we are here at Comic-Con, people are responding, we're getting tweets, like people love the film. So it's like fantastic to like be able to share something that we've been working on really hard and not really even knowing if people are gonna dig it or not. And then to have them come away from seeing the film and feeling the same way that we felt means that we actually communicated what we were trying to do, so. There's so much hate surrounding Superman Lives. There was so much hate on the internet. There's so much hate for, uh, it, there's this you know thing with Nicolas Cage that people just don't, can't perceive him pre-national treasure, you know. So that's something that you know, if you if you don't know what his his body of work was before that, you know, unfortunately, it's not. A, you can't. 
He's got an Oscar. He's an amazing actor. Um, but there's so much of that sort of naysaying around this film that one of the cool things about this is to see people's reactions afterwards going, wow, I had no idea, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, in closing, when I saw you, you made a very nice statement at the end saying, like, there's been all this talk about animating this thing or people asking, like, when can, what can we see? A right. thing that's made of this right. thing. And you talked about how a screenplay and some concept art is a blueprint, not an actual movie. Right. And I think that that's a really important thing to say because people think that, like, the script is the movie. Why can't they just make that? That's not... Who knows what they actually would have done when they got in the room? Like, right. there's the scene where, in the test footage, where Nick Cage is like, no, I don't, I don't know about this shirt. What, put him in a Mickey Mouse shirt. Yeah. Clark Kent in a Mickey Mouse shirt? That is the weirdest decision, and yet kind of awesome? Yeah. I'm still not sold. I don't think I need to see that movie. But <laughs> I love that we saw that that movie almost got made. Yeah. Um, so thank you for making the movie. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. And uh, if you guys want to check it out, once again, go to our website. It's available as a digital download or a Blu-ray with 10 hours of extra footage. We basically cut all of the interviews, recut all everything, and include it as much as possible just so you get a, an even fuller experience. If you dig the film, you'll want to check out all the extras. Yeah, you can go really deep with this extra footage. Just 10 hours, a full extended John Peters interview. <laughs> which you don't want to miss. It's almost an hour. One of, one of my favorite um, interviews. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but you can find us also on Twitter, at uh, T-D-O-S-L-W-H, and uh, the website, as we said, is www.tdoslwh.com, which is every letter of the death of Superman lives, what happened. Yeah, if, he, if people wanted to, like, well, that's really weird. Yeah, yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah.